So welcome to the Kubernetes community meeting, July 21st, happy birthday Kubernetes edition. Uh, it is Kubernetes first birthday, which is super exciting. And then we also have our normal agenda of, uh, of, demo, of a demo and then um, notices and updates from new special interest groups that we don't often hear from. So this, uh, this week we will be hearing from Six Windows. Uh, Sue is going to be giving us an update from Six Windows. We're going to get a uh, update from Ewan, and then SIG API Machinery David is going to give us an update. Then there's a couple of other quick things. Uh, as I mentioned, it's Kubernetes birthday, and we have 20 odd Kubernetes birthday parties happening around the world. Um, I put those in the notes as well. So let's get started with Nicholas Weaver from Intel, and he asked us for a little bit of a longer spot uh, for a demo. So we'll we'll see a little longer demo today. So. Nicholas, do you want to introduce yourself and snap? Sure thing. Um, can everybody hear me? Sweet. Um, hi, uh, my name is Nicholas Weaver. I work for mm -hmm. Intel. Um, some of you may have heard of us. Um, we do computers. I, I run a team that works on uh, orchestration, scheduling, telemetry, and emerging technology for cloud, a uh, software focus group. And we built a piece of software last year called Snap. It's if you want to boil it down to the simplest form, it's a Golang-based um, telemetry collection tool intended to get data out of hardware and software and make it easily consumable by cloud. And so one of the things we had kind of talked with uh, different people at Google and in the Kubernetes community and uh, some uh, customers of ours was we should look into doing um, more work with Snap around Kubernetes. So in our discussions, we decided to go do a POC we call KubeSnap, and I'm gonna share my screen once I figure out how to do it. How do you share your screen on Zoom? Oh, the big at button the that bottom. says share screen, thanks. I'll, I'll right, use at the bottom in the big green one, yeah. Sorry, I am in management, so uh, you gotta forgive me. Um, okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Sweet. All right. So I got, I got a really, really tiny deck here. Um, I'm going to roll through. Basically, um, you, you, you guys have this thing called Google out there, and we have really good readme's and documentation online. So I'm not going to try to go through selling you what Snap is or what it does. I'm going to kind of get straight to the demo about what we built and kind of why that might be valuable. And then we can follow up with some Q&A. And um, also, if you'd like to go look online or ping me offline, we can show you more information. But basically, Snap is a telemetry framework that has uh, a real strong focus on automation and operational ease. So the idea is you're able to do almost everything dynamically. So add plugins, upgrade plugins, cluster resources, um, do distributed flow across multiple nodes. Um, the purpose is really just to try to get um, the data out of systems um, in a really easy to consume manner. And from a selfish perspective, we at Intel have a lot of really, really smart people who are great at things like power and thermal and we make hard drives and we make network cards and we make computer chips and we make memory. And so we have lots of really smart people that can get really great data out of those things. But historically we haven't necessarily made it easy to collect those into one place or get access to them. So snap is our way of having an open source tool where we will continue to expose lots of stuff we do and hopefully drive really cool use cases for consumers, users and stack builders. Um, our architecture has a real simple three component kind of model. We're not the ones to invent plugins and we're not the ones to invent um, data processing pipelines, but we use collection as a plugin model. So anything where you would get data out of something, we have a model in the middle called processing where you can do like manipulation, ORM switching, encryption, things like that where you want to manipulate the data or the telemetry in line as it's flowing. And then we have a publishing plugin, which is the ability to sync that data into a wide variety of systems um, from file to, in this example, I'm about to show Heapster to Influx to um, Cassandra or even like um, online services like uh, SignalFX or others. So for this demo or this POC, um, what did we do? We basically, re we replaced C Advisor completely with Snap. So the demo I'm gonna show, there is no C Advisor. We extended uh, Heapster to have a Snap data source. So Heapster can directly talk to Snap and pull data from it. Snap D or the daemon that is the service for Snap is deployed as a daemon set. So this is fully deployed. 
and the SnapD nodes are configured and clustered as part of a tribe. And without going into a huge amount of detail on tribe, tribe is basically a masterless clustering using uh, gossip that allows you to manage a cluster of snap nodes as if it was one node. So you don't have to do like re repeat operations. You don't really need like a puppet or chef alongside to manage it. So with that, let me go to the demo. Yeah, I think I'm sharing my desktop, right? Okay, so what's gonna happen here in the demo is this. Um, we built this entire POC on top of GCE using the E2E testing. So I'm going to fire up using the normal E2E test scripts um, on GCE. And what we did with this is we basically have a repo called kubesnap, which we already have open sourced. And I'll point to it at the end of this, at the PowerPoint. We're following the, that, cloning it down and running the provisioning tools. You'll actually provision the NDE testi, testing. You'll deploy snap as a daemon set. And you'll um, wire it up to Heapster and you'll wire up everything you see. So everything you see in the demos I'm doing, and by the way, I'm using a video because we compressed it down so I could keep uh, the time nice and short for Sarah. But everything I'm doing in this entire video and demo is something you can actually go to the repo, download, and run it yourself and experiment with. So we wanted to make sure that anything we could do could be proven. Um, so I'm going to fast forward just a little bit for time's sake, but basically we go through the whole NTE EDE deploy, which most of you are probably very familiar with. We configure Snap and we run the tests and everything passes. So the big thing about that is um, in this kube snap POC, uh, Kubernetes itself, when snap replaces C advisor, has no idea that C advisor isn't there. Everything works the way it normally does. And as I'll show you in the next part. So the next part, based on this setup, we actually go and we deploy, I'll show you the cluster info first here, um, but we actually go and deploy a, um, a PHP application on top of Apache with a pod, and then we go and take, um, which I'm gonna do right now, as you can see, and then we go and we take the HPA, the auto scaling settings, and we actually set it to auto scale this pod based on CPU target of 50%. And so the goal here is to prove that Snap's feeding Heapster works with auto scale completely for both scale up and scale down. So for those that have done auto scale really well, this will look pretty familiar, we are set a min of one, a max of three, And then we're going to go up here at the top, and we're going to go into a, uh, a small shell, a uh, busy box shell, and we're going to actually generate some load across this PHP application, which is going to cause it to scale. So I'm going to fast forward a bit more. And we're targeting the service endpoint for this PHP application, just to be clear. So we're generating load. We'll go to our Git pods in our HPA setup, HPA setup and actually watch. The target's 50%, you give it a second here and it'll auto scale up to three nodes or three pods. That's pretty cool. And then um, we go up top and we actually stop the uh, load and then we watch the auto scale, scale the service back down. So this is all running on top of the kube snap setup. So this is no C advisor in place. This is snap heapster and so on. Then um, we actually have a little video here. I'll fast forward into where we go into Grafana. And it's not the exact same run, but the same setup sped up a little bit for the sake of uh, um, this demo. We basically have a graph of our original application, the PHP applicate pod running up top with the ingress and egress network settings from Snap through Heapster um, at the bottom. And then you can watch live as the load spikes as we generate load. And then you can watch the auto scale automatically turn on an additional node and it distributes the load across. And then if you, as you watch, a third um, pod will come up and it'll continue to scale that load across the third pod. And then a little bit further, we actually kill the load. You'll watch it load will go back down and you'll watch it stop the two extra pods and, you, and we put a little more extra load just so we load up the third one. So graphically we're just demonstrating in Grafana using the same data that um, uh, Heapster is using the visualization. Okay, one more final, final tidbit before we can go to Q&A and walk through a bit more of the detail. Um, so looking at all the pods and namespaces, once again, you can see Snap itself is running on, on the master and on three of the minions at the bottom. 
And what I want to demonstrate here is that um, the snap itself is actually easy to manage when it's deployed. So in this case, I'm going to quickly just port forward um, each of those three minion nodes to, uh, to a local port for me to access, uh, 601, 602, and 603. So those are each of the snap daemons. So snap itself has a REST API on it, so you can actually manage it. And when it's clustered, any of the operations um, for plugins and tasks and a lot of different things are actually handled as a cluster. So you can change one thing and it replicates across the rest of the, in the cluster, um, so it makes it a little bit easier to manage things. In this case, um, in this case was that a question or did somebody sneeze? I think somebody sneezed, right? Yeah, okay. Um, in this case, we're showing you that um, for each one of the snap nodes, we have three plugins loaded. So I mentioned before, there's three types of plugins, collector, processor, publisher. So in this case, we have a Docker plugin at version eight, which is where we're getting most of our metrics that you're seeing show up in the previous two examples. We have our Heapster publisher, which is how we're providing the Heapster API interface that Heapster's getting its data from. And then we have, just for the heck of it, a file um, publisher as well. So if we wanted to write out any of this data directly to a file locally, we could. So what we're going to show you next is um, the metric list. So when you load plugins, a metric catalog is dynamically generated with all the values you could collect off of. And so in this case, um, I'll show you that we have, this is mostly just our Docker plugin. We have quite a lot of different metrics. You'll also notice there's a asterisk in the middle. For places where there's dynamically um, populated values, like the container ID and stuff, you can actually drop in wild cards and do like, you know, query selections against the space. So you can do things like, like um, I'll show you in a second, our task manifest, we're just choosing everything that's inside this Docker plugin. And one thing to pay attention to is that column on the right that says eight, because that's version eight is providing the, that metric namespace specifically. So a task, which I, you'll see listed right here off our third node, is what collects data. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to export the details of this task, which is already running. So this is the task that was running and populating the data that Heapster was collecting. So um, all tasks go in and out as manifest, which can be YAML or JSON. So we're just exporting the manifest out. And if you look at the detail right here, there's a couple things to look at. First of all, up here in the beginning of the tree, we're collecting metrics. And you'll notice that our metrics selection, which is that forward slash Intel, forward slash Docker, forward slash asterisk, is basically saying everything after that. So that's why we're getting all the metrics. So if we were to add new types of metrics, for example, by upgrading a plugin, we'd automatically start collecting the new ones without having to touch this file. You'll notice in the next section, the publish key is where we're actually calling out to go to the Heapster plugin and actually provide an endpoint that Heapster can collect against, including you know what kind of how long a stat span or depth that we would like. Um, skipping forward just a little bit um, for time's sake. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, we're actually going to we actually have a new version of the plugin. So we're running version eight right now, but I'm actually going to load a new version of version nine, which has um, the ex the exact same metrics that were in version eight, but I've got a bunch of new ones that we added. Um, maybe it's a new version of Docker, or maybe it's a new version of C groups underneath. So we load version nine into plugin number, or I'm sorry, snap daemon number three, so 6003. So we've, we've only loaded this plugin into one of the three minions. And then we're going to do a plugin list on that same one. You'll see that now you have an extra version of Docker plugin. You have version nine is now loaded. And um, at the same time, we're going to go ahead and print out the values on the other two on 6002 and on 6001. And if you'll notice, they both also now have um, version 9 loaded as well. And this goes back to our tribe feature, which allows them to um, follow each other for certain updates, for plugin updates, um, creating new tasks, those kind of things. So you, if you had a thousand um, minions in this case, and you wanted to upgrade the plugins across there, add new values. Um, we also restart our task here. You don't actually have to start the task. Um, or stop it to load things. But the big thing to point out is this right here. It's the metric list. So you'll notice now there's a new, for each one of the Docker-based ones, there's more than one plugin, so there's more than one version that supports it. You'll see an eight and a nine. And if we scroll up, you'll notice that um, so there's actually some new namespaces, like PID stats limits and usage limits. And scroll up a little higher, I think we have some cool networking ones as well. They were actually added in version nine. And so um, a couple of cool things about this. Snap allows you to dynamically add new metrics or data or plugins on the fly without having to restart anything. 
Also, in our task, in the collection, we weren't pinning to a version, which means that task which was running, if there's a newer version available, will automatically start getting that. And because our queries are dynamic, it'll automatically catch the new metrics as well. So you have the, our mechanism allows you to actually add new metrics or custom metrics on the fly, automatically have them go through and automatically have them populate. Um, because of the length of the demo here and for time's sake, we can't go through um, dynamically creating graphs and all this and other things. Um, but the point is that our goal with Snap was to make this highly extensible so I can have uh, lots and lots of different plugins and lots of values and data. Um, going from the demo, and I think I was the last big piece was that, yeah. Going from the demo back to the slide deck for a second, let me show you, walk you through a couple things, then we can switch to Q&A and I can give everybody some time back. So repo-wise, um, Snap itself is under uh, Intel SDI-X slash Snap. You'll find it here. You have a lot of information. Uh, if you're curious about how it works, how it runs, or anything else, and we have contacts at the bottom if you want to ping anyone for questions. Snap it also has a pretty massive catalog list, and it's getting bigger. Um, if you go to our plugin catalog off our Snap repo, we have, uh, I lost count, but everything from Apache through Ftool, OpenStack stuff, MySQL, databases, these are all just collectors and publishers, mostly. But um, we can sync to almost every open source backend right now, and uh, we have a lot of really cool data that you can go and collect. We also have about seven or eight plugins that are just about to open source as well, which are going to get appended to this list. And finally, there's the Intel SDIX Kube Snap repo. It's open source. It's out there. It's a lot more detailed than what I showed in the video. If you go to the Kube Snap repo, we worked very hard that you can actually follow along on GCE and do everything I did yourself. So all the instructions are there, you can clone down. It's wired to the E2E testing, which because of some recent bug fixes is a lot more stable, which is awesome for us. You guys ended up fixing um, stuff that we were running into. But you should be able to follow along with this and experiment on your own for anything you'd like to do. Okay, um, so with that, Alicia, a couple last slides and then I can switch to Q&A. So our next steps, if you're curious what we're planning on doing, um, we'd like to submit a PR to Heapster to add Snap as an optional data source. Um, we'd like to add um, also a PR for documentation reasons as Snap as an alternative to C Advisor. The way we look at it is um, we, we do a lot of things very different from C Advisor. We also have, I mean, to be quite honest, we've got 20 people on this because Snap has wide use outside of just Kubernetes. And our community is already bigger than our own team on it. So we're looking to make Snap an optional opt-in selection if somebody wants to use it we provide value we're not trying to kill off c advisor um, if, c, if there's things that c advisor we can help do we'll do that and that's why we're not planning on trying to um, uncouple c advisor in any way we're just trying to make this an option for people that may be interested in using this instead uh, but we need to do the due diligence for a couple things one is we have to make sure heapster can support it and we support that part of heapster so we'll keep that working and running um, and make sure people are always fixing bugs on that We'll have documentation and or ways to actually choose to opt in for Snap with Kubernetes, and we'll maintain support on that as well. And then also, right now, Snap is considered beta, but we have a 1.0 plan that we're about to announce. Where we'll actually have um, wider information as far as Snap support, what that means, how bugs are handled, and things like that for our community. So expect that announcement pretty shortly. Um, and I'm going to leave this slide up right here um, for feedback. And then I, I believe the guys in the room are telling me I got some questions on the uh, chat. So I'll handle those real quick, if that's okay, Sarah. And then I can take audio ones if needed. That's great. Go for it. There were a couple in chat, as you said. Sweet. Um, so, Derek, I am confused on why C Advisor is replaced. Is it possible that C Advisor could just get the features you need and not replace it? Um, there's a pretty massive architectural difference between C Advisor and Snap. Um, uh, so, it, it, it it would be a, we'd have to basically turn C Advisor into Snap. So you can make the argument that Snap could be overkill um, versus C Advisor, but we bring a lot of different value and we had to make some really tough architectural choices that took a lot of work. Like we spent probably six months on plugin APIs and managing the, all the dynamic, dynamic pieces, a bunch of stuff you'd have to redo in C Advisor. So if C Advisor works for your purposes and you don't really need all the cool features Snap may bring you, then you don't have to use Snap and we're cool with that. Um, we kind of like the win by value. If we make people's lives easier, that's awesome. Um, I definitely don't want to, I'm not after killing C Advisor by any means. And yeah, if there's C Advisor, we're totally for that. Yeah, to elaborate on my question, I guess 
one thing I was just trying to tease out is um, there was a lot of cool stuff sitting there. Uh, and then as we look on the Kubernetes roadmap or as we have features, like a lot of the core features we add into the Cuba end up driving requirements into C Advisor. And I just worry about how we keep these things in sync across replacements. So I'll just name like two things. Like one of the things we're working on right now in 1.4 is disk eviction. So like um, that is requiring work all the way down to C Advisor as well, and then like out of memory handling, or like all the various storage drivers that Docker supports. I just wonder how people track parity on that. And the one thing I was wondering is, I thought the long-term plan probably was that the Kubelet was going to embed a minimal C Advisor, and then if you wanted richer stack collections, you'd run these like KubeSnap as like a daemon set pod. And I was just curious if you've looked at that option as a means of deploying what I mean, they look very cool. Um, well, so KubeSnap itself, KubeSnap is basically a, 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 a repo that lets you automate the process of putting Snap in so you can play with it. So to be real clear, so, so our long-term goal is to have support instructions or the options for installing Snap instead of C Advisor. So from an Intel perspective, we're extremely committed to Kubernetes. So the, on the call, I've got Connor, Balaji, Nick, others in my team that are working on the Kubernetes um, oversubscription and QoS stuff, like we're trying to, we want to contribute in lots of different ways. So if, if there's requirements for Snap to align to support pieces of Kubernetes, where we have to commit to supporting APIs or aligning, we're totally open to that because we're very committed to being valuable to the Kubernetes community. Um, there's a lot of stuff we bring, which, because of our extensibility, that I think is a I, I, I guess I, I, wasn't, I wasn't challenging that message. I thought what you showed was compelling. I was just asking the thing that's doing the metrics collection is have you looked at deploying that thing as a privileged pod on each node in the cluster rather than having to modify the kubelet code itself? So we didn't, we, for this demo, we didn't modify the kubelet code. It is, it so is what running standalone. What did you mean when you swapped out C Advisor? Literally, C Advisor is running. Yeah, C Advisor is a, is a deployed service. It's not running. We just pointed Heapster at Snap instead of pointing at the C, the C Advisor API. So we, we, the, the, we did not, there's no upstream changes to the kubelet here. And there's no, upstream, the only upstream changes we have. Okay, is so, so C Advisor is still running embedded in the kubelet. Yes, I, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, no, nothing's talking to it from the um, Heapster side. Okay, maybe we can follow up on, if you chat in the Signode Slack channel, maybe we can yeah, follow up. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is I'm doing the demo, but there's a team of about, what, six that we're doing on this, and we can all join Signode and go through it in detail for you, too. Yeah, yeah let me just great. intensify the question here. Um, since Snap is a superset of what C Advisor does, uh, it would, and C Advisor is actually kind of expensive, wouldn't it be better to only have Snap running and not have C Advisor running? And I thought there was already work on allowing something to provide the needed metrics other than C Advisor. I, I think this is, I mean, for me, here, I want to be really clear. We did this demo just to kind of inspire this conversation. And, it, at the, and we should, we definitely are willing to go through in detail and explore more. And if, if that's something, the thing I worry about is I, I wouldn't want you to depend on us unless we're committed and we support it. And it's very clear what you need us to do with Snap. But I would love to explore that more on Signode and also talk about anything ugly about Snap that we need to fix. Yeah, yeah, bring so it up. It sounds my like team is also working on something that's another alternative to C Advisor that also is a big architectural change and kind of like Snap, only more so. Uh, so this question is relevant to us too. Sweet, awesome. Sounds like um, a new conversation to be had. And I'm gonna wrap you up, Nicholas, without wait. more. Wait. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, wrap wrap this up and move on to next things since we've gone a couple of minutes over and it sounds like this will be a conversation that continues in Signode anyway. Thanks for the time. Yeah, happy to. Um, okay, so up next is Clayton Coleman who is going to actually talk uh, on K Kubernetes birthday today about why Red Hat jumped in and really wants to, or finds this uh, strategically important to contribute to Kubernetes. So Clayton, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So um, for those who don't know me, my name is Clayton Coleman. Um, I'm a contributor to Kubernetes. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the lead engineers on OpenShift. Um, I've kind of been involved in Kubernetes from the very beginning, but 
you know, really early on, um, and I'll try to keep this short, I could probably talk for 35 years about this topic, even though it's only been two years since we started. Okay, but you get like four minutes. Okay, <laughs> I'll just use 30 seconds of it. Um, you know, our goal at Red Hat was, um, I worked on OpenShift for a long time, OpenShift is platform as a service, and we looked around and we said, um, platform as a service doesn't really solve the problems that people care about. Pro platform as a, solve as a service um, helps administration teams run applications, it helps developers stay focused, but there's a lot of flexibility that you lose with that. And so when um, Kubernetes was released, it was very important to us to say, you know what, um, we think that there's a, a paradigm shift coming, and I think everybody else has probably seen it by this point as well, is um, developers, uh, deployers, real applications need more flexibility than what the first uh, round of platform as a service provided. And Kubernetes was right at that low level of abstraction that said um, you can run containers, um, but you also need these concepts that sit on top of containers to make them useful at scale. So you need the tools that make applications easy to build. And that also resonated with us as well, right? Like Kubernetes is an application-focused platform. It's not infrastructure-focused. It's not about um, abstracting hardware so that it's easy for vendors to go plug hardware in. Um, it's not necessarily about the tools, it's about the patterns. So instead of um, modeling load balancers, we model services. Um, and all of the characteristics of a service flow out of that. And so that, that initially appealed to us. Um, we've been you know, very involved from the beginning on trying to help make Kubernetes um, succeed as a platform for people to build stuff on top of. And that's not just Kubernetes itself, that's um, all of the people in the community, everybody on this, um, on this meeting who've contributed um, code or built projects on top of Kubernetes, like that success actually matters to us as well because we really do think that Kubernetes is the seed of, um, you know, the best opportunity that we have at least for being a, an application platform that can run across any environment. And, you know, as Minikube demonstrates, you go from the small scale all the way up to, you know, the thousand node clusters that folks like Chris were setting up to run Cassandra, um, that scale and that setup if that works and if people can build and run applications on top of Kubernetes, then essentially we have kind of that next operating system level, which is you move off the single machine to the cloud. So you know, for all of the technical reasons, but also for the fact that um, you know, there's an incredibly bright and talented group of folks working on Kubernetes, you know, everybody who's contributed you know, from the very beginning, um, everybody who's gotten involved in the last year, it's been uh, extremely exciting to work with um, you know, everybody uh, in the community, all 830 as of this morning, um, people who've contributed code to Kubernetes. And I think you know, one of the personal things is, you know, I worked on OpenStack, I've been involved in uh, other community source projects, um, over, uh, over the, uh, the past couple of years. But Kubernetes is really interesting because a lot of the use cases that we've had from the very beginning have been driven by people um, like Sam at Box uh, and the guys at Samsung on focusing on actually solving like very, very hard problems at scale in a way that also is beneficial to everybody at the lower scale. And the guys from CoreOS have been involved as well. You know, at CD as a, as a key con uh, you know, contributor of a, of a distributed a simple database that we can use to back cube. You know, there were a lot of people originally who said that's never going to work, but you know, this community made that bet and made that bet pan out. And the guys from CoreOS have been fantastic at supporting where Kubernetes um, has gone, the performance requirements, um, the use cases. So, you know, more than anything else, seeing this community come together and put in place real technical change to solve problems has been extremely exciting. So for all those reasons, um, for everything else, you know, we, we believe in the mission of Kubernetes. And um, you know, my call to action for everybody else on Cube's first birthday is um, the email Brian sent out to the Kubernetes dev list really is um, some of the most important things we need to deal with, the stuff that Sarah and others have been working on is how do we scale this community? And how do we go to that next level? Can we, can we make Cube even more extensible? Can we bring in folks like Intel? Um, when there's technologies that can be drop-in replacements and easily fit those into um, the platform so that everybody can benefit. So I am very excited about that. I, I urge everyone to read Brian's email and I urge everybody else to, um, to get involved in the SIGs to, um, to help make the next, uh, the next year of Kubernetes be as exciting as the first. Thanks, Clayton. That's Thanks, awesome. All right, I'm going to point people to you uh, individually to keep us moving because one of the big requests I've had recently is can we make this uh, community meeting more technical. So I've started requesting that all the SIGs report out on some sort of cadence. And so this week we actually have SIGs we haven't heard from in a while. 
So let's start with SIG Windows, which some of you may not even have known existed. So Jitu, can you tell us what's going on in SIG Windows? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, the SIG Windows basically started with a technical investigation, and uh, we basically followed it with a minimal viable POC to determine limitations of supporting Kubernetes for Windows containers. And as part of the POC, uh, we decided that to initially have the uh, Kubernetes control plane, uh, that is API server and HCD uh, running on Linux, and have Kubelet uh, running on Windows container host. We also basically uh, decided to initially focus our uh, efforts on container runtime, pod architecture, kube proxy, and kubelet integration, and then basically move on to CI advisor and OAN score implementation. So as part of the POC, we added support uh, for Windows container runtime uh, to kubelet, and we uh, started basically exploring how the pod would be architected, and as Windows doesn't have a uh, network uh, namespace and Docker for Windows also basically doesn't support uh, sharing network stack with other containers. So the initial POC basically concentrated on having uh, one pod equal to one uh, container construct. We basically did some uh, research on the networking modes that Windows containers support and we narrowed down on L2 bridge mode uh, uh, to use because it allows uh, L2 L2 mode networking. Yep, so uh, also as part of the POC, uh, the other thing that we decided was to basically run a kube proxy in Linux and basically uh, talk uh, talk to the API server, which is also running on Linux, and then forward uh, the traffic between Windows container host and uh, the Linux node where the kube proxy is running. Uh, we currently are having some issues basically with that approach and we are basically working with Microsoft to resolve those and my colleague basic uh, Michael Michael would give a small update on uh, on that front and uh, We are also basically exploring uh, using open we switch for part to part communication and we are basically uh, Getting help with uh, folks from cloud base on, on that effort uh, Michael, Michael, if you are on, uh, are you on the call? And if you want to give a quick update on the things that we are working on with Microsoft. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jitu. Uh, I apologize if you guys cannot hear me clearly. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have a great network connection. Um, yeah. So, like Jitu said, um, excuse me. We can hear you fine. Excellent. Um, like Jitu mentioned, uh, we landed on the L2 bridge mode as our networking mode that we plan to use for uh, Kubernetes. Um, and one of the requirements of the L2 bridge mode is if you want to bridge the connection across multiple container hosts um, so that you could have one pod that's part of the same application or service talk to another pod that landed on a different container host, then what Microsoft requires is that you have an identical networking configuration on both of those two nodes. Uh, that means everything has to be the same. The, the gateways, the IP address ranges, uh, DNS settings, everything. So that opened up a little security risk because once you do that, then any container on any host can talk to any other container either on the same host or any other host. So essentially you get no networking isolation uh, for a pod or for any other construct. Uh, once we discovered that we started working with Microsoft right away and we escalated that, that request and essentially um, we don't necessarily have an answer yet from Microsoft, but they're working they're They're actively interested in supporting us and they're actively working on a couple of different solutions uh, that potentially could provide relief in this area. Um, the, the idea here is to create a private network that you can subscribe containers to and the private network could span a single host or multiple hosts. Um, one of the difficulties of that, obviously, is that Microsoft is on the latest stages of Windows Server 2016. Their ability to execute and deliver this feature on time is met by schedule pressure. So we don't have a confirmed commitment from Microsoft that they're going to make this happen. So we're, um, you know, we'll probably have a better update in the next three or four weeks. Uh, but as of right now, we're we're still waiting for them to architect this solution so we can have a community discussion around that architecture and make sure that it meets our needs. 
um, th that call will probably be in about two weeks from today. Um, the, as, a, as, a, as a concurrent path, we're also looking at CloudBase, uh, which is one of our uh, community members for the SIG Windows. Um, and they have contributed heavily into the Open vSwitch implementation. So Open vSwitch and Oven, um, they have a solution around overlay networks that basically allows you to create a networking connection that could span multiple hosts and subscribe to that. Now, OVN has not been tested on Windows and its implementation has been heavily tested only on Linux. So uh, as we are gearing up on, on trying an implementation and the prototype of that solution, we'll probably have more details on that also within the next few weeks. But uh, we have been in active talks with, uh, with Guru from the Open OpenBSH uh, team, um, the cloud-based folks, and we're trying all their different solutions. So Michael, can I interrupt you and see if we can get more, if get any questions that might be out there? Because we've got about another minute, maybe two, before I want to move on to the next SIG or point people to join you at the Windows SIG. Absolutely, no problem. Questions, anyone? Really? Well then, clearly Michael and YouTube gave us a fantastic update. Um, one of the things I, I know that when we when I called into the SIG uh, meeting uh, maybe a month and a half ago, I promised you guys that we we're going to sit down and talk about the pod architecture. We still owe you that sit down. The reason why we haven't scheduled this yet is because we haven't cleared out all our networking issues. So we're hitting one issue after the other on networking. Once we clear that out and we understand what our networking options will be for Windows Server containers, we will set that meeting up. So we have not forgotten that it's just like other circumstances have not enabled us to make progress. So that's the SIG node uh, meeting that you guys are going to participate in and work with in order to make sure this fits with the existing architecture. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Are you, <coughs> are you discussing the... Here, I'm, I'll go unmuted and you can just talk. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you discussing the networking issues with SIG Network? Uh, we have not involved SIG Network at all yet. Because the, the, the network isolation that you're looking for uh, doesn't exist in many uh, networking configurations of Kubernetes. Uh, and the networking SIG has been discussing how to express those kinds of policies, but I wouldn't necessarily set the bar higher than other Kubernetes configurations on Linux. So you might be making it harder than you than you need to. Possibly. All right. Well, well, well issues uh, are being discussed well, on SIG network, so I would suggest at least touching base there occasionally. Okay, we will do that. Thanks. Excellent. Anybody else? All right, let's go on next to Signode. Sure. I'll just kind of give a quick overview of things that we are, we've been working on towards 1.4 because pretty much uh, I think those are the interesting topics that we've got right now. Um, I'll also quickly talk about a couple things that hit 1.3. If you don't know, we have Rocket Container Support, uh, sorry, Rocket Runtime Support, where you can swap the kubelet to use Rocket as your container runtime. And I think that's really cool. We also had init containers launch as Alpha, which gives users more flexibility to do things like set up volumes. Um, but some of, some of the ongoing work that we're focusing on now are things related to supporting alternate runtimes better, such as the hyper runtime and continuing to support the Rocket Runtime, which will also make code more maintainable. That work is being driven by the hyper guys in the form of the client server integration proposal and also by the Google guys in the form of the container runtime interface, which will hopefully make this all more maintainable. We've been working on making the node more reliable in terms of things like disk usage. We've got um, work towards making image images be managed better when you're running low on disk space, delete images. Um, when you're running low on disk space, evict pods potentially, which that's something Derek's got a proposal out on and has been working on, which is Awesome. Also more reliability in terms of isolation between things by having pod level C groups where burstable pods and guaranteed pods and so on have a little more isolation between them and a little better control from the kubelet by putting them under a C group that 
is created and controlled by it. Um, there's also been some work on app armor and a few other cool things like that. Um, I think I think those are kind of the high level topics and I'd be happy to talk in more detail about any of them or if I missed any, I'm sure Derek can talk about it. Um, we also have weekly meeting notes, which I just emailed out to the SIG yesterday, I believe they linked to them as well as the summary of our last meeting. I encourage checking them out if you want to know more or ask some questions now as well. Uh, any questions? Any? Anything other than complete silence? Or Derek, do you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, I would say it was a good summary. And I guess the only thing I'm not sure if I heard there was there has been some discussion around just getting a generic OCI runtime implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And I don't believe that that proposal has merged yet, but mm -hmm. I encourage folks to review that and give their input as well. So to the whole idea of having this be um, a place for escalation of any cross, cross community or cross um, special interest group needs, is there anything that you, um, that you and Node collectively need from the rest of the group or anything you want people to weigh in on as far as architectural things or just come join you if they want to help? I'm not sure if I have anything specific to shout out about there. Okay. Cool. Or do you have anything, especially related to eviction? That seems like something that... Um, no, I think we've had some good discussions on that topic with SIG scheduling, at least with David Oppenheimer. Um, but yeah, I think we would encourage anybody to come. And, and for folks who are looking to become new contributors, I know one thing that everybody would appreciate is anything that can be done to make the Kubelet code more readable or more understandable, whether that's just writing documentation, Godoc, or anything like that, it's probably well appreciated. And uh, it's a good place for folks to jump in and, and learn the code base. Awesome, thanks. All right, well, let's jump on next to the SIG API machinery. David Eads is going to give us an update. So in API machinery is last time, we spoke about three objectives for one four. We want to take the garbage collection controller. Uh, some people might know it as like a server side reaping. Um, and we'd like to get it to a point where we can turn it on by default for at least one controller. There are a couple issues that we're dealing with and there's an umbrella issue uh, to track it in the agenda notes for uh, SIG API machinery. If you're interested in precisely what's getting fixed and what we're trying to do for one four. The next thing that we want to do is we want to generate uh, more complete swagger uh, to the point where someone might be able to run a generator against it. It's something that many people have asked to be able to do so that they can generate swagger for the server and then generate their Python or Java or Ruby um, client code. So we are going to be working towards that. Um, and one person was dedicated to make that work. Uh, the last major thing of external interest is uh, splitting out the Go client. Um, there is a plan to split out a versioned only Go client for, uh, for other repos to build on top of. Uh, it is intended to be versioned only um, and there are a couple <laughs> Uh, there are a couple. Day, he's just about jumping up and down in his video. <laughs> um, there are uh, a couple of significant issues to work through regarding how we would actually make use of that for migration purposes. Um, but our goal is to split it out and to, in turn, try to depend upon it and build at least one thing on top of it uh, inside of the cube repo. Um, those are the major external facing pieces. There are some internal pieces regarding uh, storage and some technicalities about how you put and serialize things into etcd. If somebody wants to go into it, I can, but uh, otherwise I think that is the major uh, interest areas. So does anybody have questions or discussion points? Is there a tracking issue for Golang? Yes, Aaron is super excited about this for the Golang. Um, I can do one better. We have a poll um, that is starting to uh, to split that out. Uh, if you want to take a look at the one I have uh, just sent in there, there are some initial comments on it. It's big. 
Um, it's going to be a multi-stage process for us to get it in, though. First, we have to get the dependencies right, and then we have to break it out, and then we have to go dev it back in or vendor it back in. But this is also an exciting and awesome moment to mention that more reviews is good. So even if people are do not have a merge, um, merge privileges or don't have the LGTM privilege, please review things, add comments, talk about it, because that does help. Um, so if you're interested, grab it and, and take a peek at it. All right. That, any other questions for them? Any of the SIGs? Does anyone have specific SIGs they want to hear from next week? I have storage lined up for next week and other SIGs. Nobody cares, really? This isn't specific to the SIG, but I guess, again, on the Golang client issue, just since we've been, uh, I see something in the meeting notes about a uh, feature cutoff thing for 1.4. Um, and I'm sort of yes. so confused about the scope of feature work. Is this the sort of like splitting out this Golang client? Is this the sort of thing that needs to be covered by a feature issue? Or be, is it like grandfathered in because work is already ongoing? Um, we don't have a feature issue for it, I don't think. Uh, we have been working towards it um, for, well, all of 1.3 and uh, even before that. Splitting out the Go client is sort of uh, developer focused and not user focused. Um, so uh, I, I haven't thought about making a feature for it. Um, Brandon just linked in his, um, is this, a, is my thing a feature recommendation thing that he's working on to try and get us to a, a consensus on what is a feature and do we need it? Yeah, I mean, the, the heuristic I heard this morning during SIG scale was one of, if you're going to write a blog post about it, or you're going to go and brag about it, then you probably need a feature issue for it. And I, I super am not, like, I'm not trying to slow this down or throw process at this because this is super awesome. We've been talking about splitting up repos. We've said that the, like, the API and the client is a great place to start, and this is actually happening. That's why I'm super excited about this. So I'm just trying to understand, are we doing this the right way? Yeah, I think everyone's trying to figure it out um, what <laughs> what the right way is. Um, I think one of the lessons learned from 1.3 is that we sort of under-communicated. Halfway through, we realized we were under-communicating and then over-communicated. Um, and we're trying to figure out, like, how do we make the over-communication sort of spread out over everyone um, instead of putting all the load on Ecore and, uh, and on uh, Mike. And so... The like four sort of little metrics we have is perhaps a blog post is written, it requires multiple SIGs, uh, it requires significant effort, and the Brian Grant said essentially like 10 person weeks to implement or more, perhaps it requires a feature, or it impacts the UX or operation of Kubernetes substantially. And those are the metrics we have so far. We don't know if they're right, they may be right or wrong, but we should try to use them this time around um, instead of sort of self uh, uh, self-curating. This is also something we're going to learn and adjust and tweak from the 1.4 release. So as Brendan said, we don't know if they're right. Let's start here and see what happens and we'll find out if it's the right, the right metrics or not. And we'll get a better feel for it over this release. All right. Uh, we had two other things to um, touch on. One, I'm going to just give the world's fastest update on my elders proposal from last time, which is as these things happen, they're going to take longer than I had hoped. So I don't have a short list to present to you this week, but I am going to update the issue that everyone uh, has offered comments on because we have very broad um, discussion on there of saying we really need to understand this more better. So I'm going to say we apply something that looks like a product model to it and say, what would you want to escalate to an elder? Let's figure out what our use cases might be for this. And so I'll update the uh, issue with that today. And then we can get people putting in different things that they think they might want to. They can be hypotheticals. They could be specific reference cases. And then some sort of what they would want, what sort of action they would want out of it. Not, a re not the resolution, like pick my way, but I would like a resolution. I would like someone to weigh in, that kind of thing. So we'll do this from a sort of a product perspective. Um, so I'll update that today. So that's the world's fastest update on elders. 
And unless people have questions or just given that we, <laughs> yes, if two SIGs disagree on a feature, an elder is needed. Awesome. So that can go into the issue. Um, so the next thing that uh, we want to talk about is the idea of a working group around uh, the contributor experience. And I've used the phrase working group uh, once before when we were talking about how cluster lifecycle and cluster ops work together and, and whether they are two independent SIGs or not. And they stayed two independent SIGs for the moment, but sort of sub-SIGs, which is even more confusing. But they are, they're working together in a way that is, is good for everyone now. But the idea of a working group in my head has been something that is very time bounded. We know we need to push against a thing for the next six weeks or one release cycle. And we need to do this across multiple SIGs. We need to do this across the entirety of the community, but we want it to be like a tiger team that pushes against this. And contributor experience began, as, uh, began with something like this idea with all of Daniel Smith's work last, um, last release toward the fixing the merge queue. And so Brian uh, is gonna talk a little bit more about what contributor experience is looking like and there was an announcement sent out to the dev mailing list asking people who wanted to be interested or wanted to participate to join a mailing list unsurprisingly and i know bob wants more clarity around what a working group is so i will write some documentation on what a working group is and we will publish that so that it is googleable i i think sir just to clarify my request um mm -hmm. i think we've done made great strides on um uh establishing a standard way that um sigs meet uh, minimum requirements for um you know at least two leaders meeting it you know there's a official meeting time recording of notes blah 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 so i i think the we're the the full request and since i'm requesting i'm happy to help write it up is, is to um formalize a proposal for um conduct of a working group as well okay. um, so that everyone's able to know who's working on it who to contact what all the working groups are um in and i think the, if we do that it will we'll be in much better shape in in the very short um in the very shortest method is there a reason that we can't generalize what we have set for special interest groups to be all kubernetes groups working groups or special interest groups you because i think most everything is that is required would also be required of the working group i think that's absolutely right um personally i, I don't see why us why we shouldn't just maybe we don't call it a sig just we should just follow the same pattern and there should be no reason why a sig can't come into being and go away absolutely. also true yeah so i'd really like to see us use the pattern that we've already established and people are familiar with um as opposed to having a new entity that works a new way um, but I think that's perhaps what we can work on a bit in terms of a proposal. Okay. So Brian, do you want to talk about your idea with the contributor experience working group? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as Clayton mentioned, uh, I sent out email on Friday to Kubernetes dev with a number of my top concerns and contributor experience was definitely uh, one of the top areas, if not the top area of the project. And the community has grown. Uh, massively, which is great to see, but uh, it's also been very challenging for us to manage. Uh, we actually, uh, pushing towards 1.0, uh, achieved a rate of merging about 250 commits per week. And we uh, have not been able to sustain that, much less uh, break through that and increase our velocity as the community has grown. So as a consequence, uh, we're doing more things, but it takes longer to complete and merge those things. And we're working on a dashboard that shows PR metrics, but I sent out some graphs uh, which show this adds facts that uh, the length of time it takes to get a change merged uh, has been increasing monotonically and it's getting uh, pretty long, even for pretty trivial changes. Uh, so we... <coughs> have a number of people who started working on issues as Brandon sent out email. Uh, CoreOS has picked up uh, work on the owner's feature. Thank you very much for that. 
Uh, that's something we desperately need. GitHub, as we found, is really designed for small projects, small teams. Uh, they might disagree with that, but I've looked at a number of other uh, repositories across uh, GitHub, even among popular projects. And you know, on the plus side, we have achieved a velocity that's higher than almost any other project you can think of. It's higher than Rails. It's higher than Django. Um, <clears throat> it's higher than Docker, even, on a single repo basis. But you know, Docker has achieved uh, uh, a rate of 300 PRs merged per week. And the way, one of the ways they did that is uh, by fragmenting the project into multiple repositories. And that's something we're eventually going to have to do uh, and something we need to work towards. The client is one example of that. Um, you know, but Google, I don't know if everyone knows, but Google has a ginormous uh, monolithic repository, and that's the approach that we brought to this project, and it clearly doesn't scale with GitHub. So, you know, it's going to take some time to break up the project into multiple repositories. So in the meantime, we need to do things to add the extra bits of tooling uh, that GitHub lacks to make our current repository actually work. Um, so we had a number of people starting work in this area. Uh, I think we have seven or eight people now working on different things. Uh, so we formed the working group as a means of coordinating amongst those people. And right now, uh, it's mostly Googlers plus CoreOS. Uh, but we would definitely like help from the community. And there's no shortage of work. I created a wiki page in the community repo, uh, listing a bunch of the ideas we've been discussing for a long time. The things that are currently in progress are in bold. Uh, things like owners, uh, we're working on moving to the CNCF CLA, which is holding up a few people. Uh, and that's mostly uh, hooked up on automation at this point. Um, the, the work that Daniel started uh, last quarter, we need to finish. Uh, we still have problems with a lot of rebases uh, due to conflicts and generated code and docs. So there's a long list of issue, list of issues, and we'd really like your help. Please sign up for um, the Slack channel and uh, mailing list if you're interested in getting involved, uh, and just reach out to us. And I don't have a stack ranked prioritized list on the wiki page right now, but if you ask, uh, I'd be more than happy to pick something for you to work on. All right, and we are out of time. Apologies, we can pick this up again next time or people can uh, join the mailing list as we form this group and get it formalized with um, all, of the, all of the things that we require of SIGs, uh, as well as getting the idea of the working group um, formalized. So thank you all and happy, happy birthday to Kubernetes and thank you all for your contributions over the last year or however long you've been participating because that their Kubernetes is not a uh, just a pile of code. It's a whole bunch of people pushing a vision and that's really important to remember, especially when we are we, when we are uh, challenged by our own successes. So thank you very much for all of your help over the last year year and let's have another an awesome and even better year going ahead. See you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.